ओम ज्ञान When one comes to Krishna consciousness then if he's actually got an understanding of Krishna consciousness then automatically everything in else except Krishna consciousness is put in perspective and what is that perspective that anything except Krishna consciousness is meaningless useless a waste of time an obstruction in our development of the real purpose of life which is to attain pure love of Krishna In other words everything else seems or is superfluous it has no meaning as is stated in this song ei dhana jobana putra parijana iteki ache parati ti all these material accruements money use sons relatives They have no particular meaning. They simply bind one in this material world. So, if one is fortunate enough to come to Krishna consciousness as a young man, then he can go through life without having to add on these unnecessary attachments. Often we meet young men who are married, who have taken to Krishna consciousness, and they say, if only I could have found out about this before I got married. <laughs> And I wouldn't have got into all these things. Of course, we also see young men who take to Krishna consciousness who are not married and they think that Krishna consciousness is so wonderful. Now all I need to make it perfect is a nice Krishna conscious wife. <laughs> <laughs> so, different perspectives. However, one who is more intelligent doesn't think like that. He thinks that I'm so lucky I didn't get entangled in all these things. A few years ago I was uh, on a suburban train going through South London. I'm from London. Oh, this body's from London. and uh, going through the outer parts of london i think i told this when i was last here also mm-hmm. right. and seeing in south london so many miles of houses of people who are successes in life so called successes you could see the semi detached houses I don't know how you say that in Hindi. You have to work that out. I mean, so just, these are houses which are somewhat costly houses, and you can see the, the how the cars are parked. Maybe they probably they go by local train into London because it's a hell of a problem parking, traffic jams. So their cars are there. Their Mercedes cars, their BMWs, with their yachts. You know what a yacht is. It's a pleasure boat. People on the weekends or on their holidays, it's like a dinghy, I guess you'd say, with a sail. And on their weekends, on the weekends they go uh, for fun. They go off to some lake with the other 5,000 yachts on the lake, and they try and have a little fun sailing around. So these are the successful people they can afford a, a good house maybe I don't know 300,000 pound house or something with a, a car maybe I don't know 25,000 pound car and a yacht these are all the signs of success so I was going through the train going through South London seeing this all these things and I thought Krishna Prabhupad thank you so much you saved me from all this you saved me i i would have you know i could have also been a success so called krishna saved me so going through that area you could 
see all these decorations of success and we, we could feel, we can feel the latent frustration in the atmosphere of all the people who are successes. It's like that also coming from Bombay to Pune on the train. We see all these Lonavla and all these places on the way that people who are successes in Bombay, they have their weekend houses at Lonavla. Expensive apartments. No happiness, just frustration. Everyone is thinking that everyone has some place to stay, some property, some place which they can call their own, my own piece of earth. Actually, most people, they don't even have a piece of earth. They have to share it with 25 families below and 25 above. <laughs> In an apartment block. It was the same... Only very expensive people can afford to live on their own. Only uh, people with lots of money can afford to live on their own plot of earth. It was the same plot of earth. If you have one bungalow, then you can build an apartment block. So only the uh, very, only the very, or the more wealthy people, or otherwise, uh, they, uh, that's one end of the scale. The other end of the scale is that you have one handkerchief piece of land, and all the other people surrounding you also have one. And it's the Jopo Tati. They also have bungalows squashed in on government, usually railway land or something like this. But they feel that this is, this is my home. This is my plot of earth. This is where I belong. Home, sweet home. Jail, sweet jail. <laughs> Tied up by that identification. I belong here. So Brahmacharya Sanya's life, that's very nice because he doesn't have any such attachment. In my place of residence, where is that? At the lotus feet of my spiritual master. That's all. And he's also moving. So, moving, 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 but fixed at the lotus feet of Krishna. That is our real residence. And this other making a home, making a residence, it's simply entanglement in this material world. So Brahmachari is very lucky. He doesn't have any personal property. Of course he may have his Bhagavad Gita, one or two sets of cloth, a pair of kautals, which he calls his own. The Brahmachai cultivates having no other property than his service to Guru and Krishna. But he has no rights. We see in the modern age, people they are very much demanding their rights. What is my right? This is my right. These are our rights. Our Women's rights, children's rights, workers' rights. Everyone has their rights. But a brahmachari has no rights. He's simply the slave of his guru. That's all. He doesn't, he doesn't have any. It's a different concept. Vedic culture. In modern life, everyone is trying to establish their rights. But in Vedic culture, everyone is simply becoming a servant with his duties and responsibilities. Instead of agitating, what is my right? Everyone has responsibilities and duties. It's round the other way. Instead of demanding that this should be done for me, rather one takes the responsibility to do things for others. And in that way, what is required to be done for you is fulfilled by Vedic culture, but not by the, taking the position of Ishvara Hamaham Bhogi, I am the controller, I am the enjoyer, I have rights. But rather one takes the position of servant. And in this way, everyone else is served, 
So there's no need of agitating for rights. But in modern demoniac society, no one wants to take responsibility for others. Even uh, they want to enjoy sex but not have responsibility. So they have abortions or so-called family planning, contraception. And even if there is a child born, then the parents are not very responsible. So this is the demoniac society, which gives more impetus, actually, to anyone who's interested in spiritual life, gives more impetus to come out of this material world altogether. When we see, that's the great quality of Kali Yoga, that it's so miserable that it's, it becomes the best age for spiritual life. In as much as the reality of material existence is clearly seen. In previous ages, if people were more civilized, well-behaved, cultured, then there might not be so much impetus to become free from material attachments because the material world might not seem to be such a bad place. But in the modern world where anyone who's even slightly spiritually awakened can see that it's a rat, rat race society, rat eat rat. That people uh, have the bodies of human beings, but their consciousness is like that of rats. It's a very good analogy, rat race, because rats, they live together and have some kind of cooperation with each other. But actually they're very uh, vile, their consciousness is very vile, they're very much self-motivated. They're simply interested in a gross sense gratification, and if their sense gratification is impeded even slightly, then they become violent. So to, to say the modern society is like a rat society, it is a, is a very good analogy. So, anyone in this modern age, if they see, they can see what is the actual situation. Why should I get entangled in this? But a young man, especially if he takes to Krishna consciousness, then he's very fortunate if he has no entanglement in home life, family life. He doesn't have to get involved in these things. A brahmachari is very fortunate because he has no other duty but to serve Guru and Krishna and become purified and go back home back to Godhead. He doesn't have to get entangled in Especially in the modern age, to support a family, it takes all your time and attention. You got your hand on your mouth. That means it's impure. You should go and wash it. And don't put it on your shirt or anywhere else. You should teach them. Don't put your hand in your mouth. This evening, we're going to, I'm going to show that book, My Memories of Prabhupada. So, that's one of my memories. Prabhupada instructing a mother not to t teach her child not to put the hand in the mouth. Wash it. Don't put it in your mouth. Only when you're brushing it or when you're eating. That's the only time. Brushing your teeth or eating. Otherwise, don't put the hand in the mouth. It's very contaminating. Well, Brahmachari should learn all these things, how to satisfy Krishna. And then, don't get involved with this material life. That's all. It's a very simple thing. I wrote this Brahmachari book, and really, whatever has to be said... Of course, there may be individual application, but practically it's all that, whatever I have to say. Maybe you have more to say. But it's actually a very simple topic. Brahmachari life, it's very simple. You get up in the morning, you chant Hare Krishna, take a little prasadam, do some seva, don't be a nonsense, and that's it. <laughs> And that, that's your day. And then the next day you do the same thing. And then the day after that you do the same thing. And one day comes when uh, you go back to God. And that's all. <laughs> it's very simple and straightforward. Now, most of the population are not brahmacharis directly. They can, they can be Krihasta brahmacharis. Most of the population are married. So I also require to write a book, Family Life in Krishna Consciousness, for which... I've already ex assembled several hundred pages of notes. It's going to be a much bigger book than the Brahmachari book because it's a much more complex subject. <laughs> it's actually a fact. It's a very... Family life is very complicated. 
What do you think, Dhanu Prabhu? You can <laughs> you can speak from personal experience. <laughs> Family life it's very complicated compared to Brahmacharya life. Very complicated. We can't expand our bhakti. Yeah. It's it's actually very difficult. I mean, even if you want to, the amount of time it takes simply to maintain a family. It takes, especially in the modern age, it takes most of your time. Then uh, you see, and then even if you have time for bhakti, you'll be worrying, you see, about daughter's marriage and so many things. And there are so many, even apart from earning money, there are so many social obligations. When your, your in-laws come and then you have to visit them, and then when you go to your village, you have to visit all the different people and talk. Of course, you can utilize it for preaching also. But it's very entangling. Often, you see, the, the brahmacharis, they get married and then they say, Oh, it's true. Everything that in the Srimad Bhagavatam about family life, it's true. They found out. <laughs> Actually, it's a fact. So family life, it's, it's very complex. It's very... Entangling, it takes up so much of our time and our energy and our thoughts. And on the whole, it's much better just if you're not married, don't get married, stay Brahmachari, chant Hare Krishna. If you don't have the determination or if circumstantially, it may be due to circumstances that one may practically be forced to get married, we find even in the Srimad Bhagavatam, a determined brahmacharya had no desire whatsoever to be married, but under pressure from no no one less than Lord Brahma, it's pretty difficult to say no. Who who over even Lord Brahma, who's the guru of Narad Muni, he overruled Priyavrata's guru. Narad Muni he was also you know his whole job is to make people brahmacharis, <laughs> even if uh, the, even if the father's against it. He's well known for that. He doesn't mind going to nice, good prospects for six. There'll be nice grihastas. They'll make very nice, good husbands. And Narad Muni comes and says, Hey, you want to know something? I got some good advice for you. Now, your father may not be very happy, but... Here, you want to know Krishna is the Supreme Lord. You don't have to get entangled in family life. Just be a brahmacharya. Say, okay. <laughs> and Daksha says, not okay. I'm not very happy. But Narad Muni? <laughs> Simply, Narad Muni Bhajai Vina Radhika Ramanana. No, he doesn't mind. So Narad Muni is very happy to make brahmacharya disciples. But if Lord Brahma comes, even Narad Muni has to say, okay. So it may be that circumstantially, under intense pressure from family, or there may be family responsibility if you're the only son, and all this kind of thing. So for some people, it may be, even you want to be a brahmacharya, it may be circumstantially very difficult to avoid getting married. And generally, even if there's no real reason for it, generally the parents, they put intense pressure anyway to get married. Because they think that, you know, why should I spoil my son's life? He wants to be a brahmacharya. He doesn't realize that the real nectar is working like an ass day and night to support a family. He has to become a responsible citizen. And what will people say if my son becomes a brahmacharya? And anyway, generally parents have all these funny ideas. So, you don't have to listen to them. I mean, you You don't have to be disrespectful to them, but at the same time, you should understand that what they say is not necessarily 100% for our real benefit, even though they think it is, because they're in, they're in mind. And they think, my son should also be in mind. It's a family tradition. <laughs> At some point in time, we have to say no to Maya, even if it comes, even if Maya comes in the form of parents. Generally, we are 
recommended to, to follow what our parents say, and certainly we may respect them, but at some point in time, whether it's this life or next life or after a thousand lives or a million lives, when some parent comes and says, you should be in Maya, at some point in time, we have to say no. And they may come and say, yes, you can chant Hare Krishna at home. And at some point in time, you have to say, well, my real home is back home, back to Godhead. So either you say it in this life, a million lives, and you may not get the chance in the next life, you might end up being a camel or a dog in your next life, if you don't take the opportunity now. So at some point in time, we have to make the decision to do whatever is required to go back home, back to Godhead. And it certainly as has been verified by a Prihasta devotee here. It's certainly a more favorable position to aim at going back to Godhead from is the Brahmacharya Ashram. Because Krihasta life means entanglement. It's not that a Krihasta can't be Krishna conscious, but at the same time he has a lot of various distractions. So it's better to be a Brahmacharya. That's all. It's a simple thing to understand. It's a simple thing to understand, but sometimes it may be difficult to put into practice. Actually, there's no difficulty. I mean, there may be some austerities in Brahmacharya life, living in a crowded room or whatever. But it's not actually people, they say Brahmacharya life is meant for austerity, but as far as I can see, householder life, much more austerity. So many difficulties. Brahmacharya life is very simple and nice. Is you may think, well, I should have a night. You see, I'm living in a room with 22 other brahmacharis. But uh, if I had a night, you know, I could have a nice bungalow of my own and then live very peacefully. But what, what do you have to go through to get that bungalow? You don't spend any time in it anyway, because you're always out working to maintain it. And most people don't even get that far. Like they, the best they get some apartment. So... It's a simple thing to understand. Putting it into practice, well, the senses are pushing. Maya is pushing. Those who are more intelligent and fortunate, they will not respond to the call of the senses, but they will respond to the call of Guru and Krishna. Come with me. Jeev Jago, Jeev Jago, Gora Chanda Bali, Kota Nidra Jaumaya How long are you going to go on with this? dance and drama, family life. How long? How long are you going to remain in time? Come. Come up. Tishta, Jagrata, Kapya, Varangi, Bodhata. Now we got this human form of life. We should get up, wake up and attain the boon of human life. So, it's a simple thing to understand. Family life, very complicated. Ashesha, Shesha, Nishesha, Ashesha, Klesha, Nishesha. Unending difficulties. So, simple, be simple, be Ramachan, Chan Hare Krishna, do your service, dedicate your life to serving Buddha and Krishna. If you want, you can also get married. That's also there. It's not a crime to get married. You shouldn't think like that. We have to see, for some devotees, it may be better to do so. If they're too much agitated, they're not fit to be a brahmacharya. But on the whole, we should understand that there's no, spiritually, there's no need for them to do so. So it's a simple topic. And that you can get, that brahmacharya book. If you don't have, you can get. I brought had some copies of it, so you can all get it. Some people say it's fanatical. Well, according to material standards, firm practice of Krishna consciousness is fanatical. According to the material outlook, you should enjoy yourself, relax, have fun, and brahmachai life, and simply concentrate firmly on the goal becoming Krishna conscious, following rules and regulations, all these things. 
So for people who want to lead a life of sense enjoyment or who want to have some kind of so-called Krishna conscious mixed with sense enjoyment, which isn't actually Krishna conscious at all, it's, it's outright compromise. So they may consider fanatic. Let them consider. Let them go on considering it fanatical from birth after birth after birth. Well, we are already gone back to God. <laughs> and they can be so-called well-adjusted, practical. You have to be practical. See, they'll say this. It's not practical. This Brahmachari life is not right practical. Actually, there's nothing impractical. There may be many objections from different parties. So it requires some fixity of purpose and philosophical understanding to understand why we're doing what we're doing. And then we can go on. It's a very nice life. Serving Krishna. Nothing else to do. No other duty. Only serving Guru and Krishna. That's all. That also requires some uh, detachment from family. Sometimes I see some devotees. I don't know about here because some well-organized ashram and all this. At least the reputation is there. So I guess it, it must be true to some extent at least. That uh, become brahmacharis or but still maintaining a lot of association with home and all this, even in a somewhat mundane way. That oh, you see, our relatives came from America. You have to come. You have to come and see them. Better they come and see you. If if for instance your relatives come from America after ten years, and then they may say oh. You have to come and see them. Better that they come and see you in the temple. That will be more beneficial for them than if you go there and then go into the home and there's so much mundane talk and all this. Of course, if you're a very good preacher and if your your family they may be somewhat open, then you can going home can be a preaching experience. But in general, even then, in general. Brahmacharya's place is Brahmachari Guru Kulevasa. His business is to live in the house of the Guru. Not that he's half in, half in here and half the time there. No, not, like, not even, not even much of the time. Sanyasi, actually, of course, a Brahmachari isn't a Sanyasi. Exactly, the Sanyasi rule is that he shouldn't visit his home at all. Although some, I know in Iskand, some of our Sanyasis do or have done, and in doing so, they've made their family members Krishna conscious. But general rule is that we've come here, now we're here. This is our family. We needn't be impolite to our family members, but at the same time, there's no need to have a protracted and extended mundane relationship with them. If you want to maintain a relationship, make it Krishna conscious. <coughs> That's all. All right, Hare Krishna. Any question? Occasionally, for some of my books, I do, there's some mundane things I'm reci- Just like I'm writing this book on Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, so it mentions some of the important people he met, and then I try to find out on the net some information about them to put in the book. So something like that, but otherwise, the internet, it's, it's preaching is there. That's one thing. Just surfing around the net looking to see what's out there, that's, that's nonsense. Also, Maharaj, some brahmacharis who have difficulty controlling their uh, senses and take to artificial forms of uh, sense gratification. Yeah, well, they should get married, actually. They get married. Even if they do that once, twice, due to past conditioning. So we be? have to see individual cases. But I mean, if someone has a habit that they're not overcoming, then... Or maybe they can gradually overcome it. It may be that they're, they're serious and sincere, but they have a bad habit, which in moments of weakness they succumb to. So we have to see each individual case. But generally we find someone who has such conditioning, gradually they become depressed and weakened. So everyone has to see individually. I mean... Same brahmacharya, it's good, but at the same time, if we're not 
actually on the platform of controlling the mind and senses, then it, it may actually be a very painful experience for someone to be a brahmachari. If, if the mind is not controlled, then it may be painful in the sense that uh, we, we feel a, a sense of contamination. On the one hand, we're living a very pure lifestyle, but then we feel ourselves so contaminated and it creates a dichotomy in the mind. Master Maharaj, sometimes uh, uh, somebody in the ashram gets... Uh, I didn't even discuss this in the book, but I mean, if you're about going on to internet sites and this and that, I mean, it just seems pornography sites, because it just seems pretty plain that if you have that much of a bad proclivity, then you're... I mean, that's not... Even and what to speak of brahmacharis, even grihastas, they have no business with such things. Pornography sites are just for degraded people, that's all. Not for someone who's interested in the absolute truth. Although it is known very well, Maharaj, some people, even after becoming devotees, uh, occasionally, sometimes they get the whole tendencies cropping up, you know, in the heart, and they try to do secretly, you know, without anybody's knowledge. They all get found out. They <laughs> all get found out. No, I, I heard, I know one case, there may be more, but I heard of one case of a the devotee was a Grihastra, actually, who was... Uh, actually, there are two cases I know of. One was not verified. He denied it. But there's something that you can see... The, you, you can see the list of previous sites, and someone went in his computer and found out he was going on such sites. I mean, even email is dangerous, because you see that often you get these spams... And I just got off, hot, I mean, I, I just made a new account yesterday. I was on Hotmail as my second account. And every time I go in, there's, there's more sexy spams than, uh, I never open them, but <laughs> you can tell what they are from the subject line, but, and even email is dangerous. Not to speak the whole world around you and everywhere, newspapers, advertisements, People, all the people around them, just Mumbai, Pune, all these cities. It's like I was saying just now. The way India is going, is very soon it's going to be more degraded than the West. And the West is very degraded. Very, very degraded. This, this, actually this internet has seen a, a tremendous expansion of pornography. And it's just, uh, it's, it's terrible. Uh, even young kids, they, they, uh, they have access to the most degraded things. And in America, they, uh, they, they, in the name of freedom of speech, they, uh, they've even, there have been court cases made to stop, but then, the, and there have been laws made in America to stop all this very degraded pornography. But then they, they come out with this thing, freedom of speech, and then they, they knock out the law. They have something in the American Constitution that separates freedom of space. Of Subhuman. Most uncultured. So we should give up all these things. Don't have any connection with that. Just even a few moments practically of it. Any contact with this just can, can spoil your Krishna consciousness. It's so degrading. Maharaj, when should uh, one be uh, considered unfit for this ashram and uh, be requested to take up another ashram? Or uh, should the, the candidate himself feel a need of changing ashram? Because sometimes we have... Sometimes the Brahmacharya, he's, he's not fit, but he... He doesn't want to admit that. Yeah, well then, he has to be convinced, or if not convinced, sometimes they, they have to, you know, it has to become clear to them by the force of Maya.
proves fit to be a brahmachari in the real sense of the term. <laughs> but at the, at the same time, if someone's reasonably or, or, or to allow it, the, Prabhupada writes actually in the first, very near the beginning of Bhagavatam, maybe in the first chapter of the first canto, that one who takes sannyas, he should be at least able to control the gross impulse. That means that naturally the Maya, you see so many things and hear so many things, there may be some disturbance in the mind. But a sannyasi he should be, probably use the word confident, he should be confident of being able to control the gross impulse. In other words, even though there are so many distractions for the mind, and it's not that officially by taking sannyas the mind doesn't become distracted. Otherwise, why there will sannyasi shouldn't be alone with a woman or sp spend much time with women. If, if by taking sannyas, then automatically you're freed from all bad desires, then there wouldn't be any such rules. The rules are there to protect the sannyasi, understanding that the mind may become disturbed by such things, and that can lead to a gross fall down. So sannyasi should be, even though it's understood that the mind is subject to various distractions, but we should be confident of not falling down in, in a gross manner. And to do that, that means that he's, that doesn't mean that the sannyasi is confident that I, I'll do any, I'll, I'll mix up with women and do so many things and I'll still maintain, but he takes precautions. Brahmachari also. Dealing with women. There's no such thing as not dealing with women. Especially in the modern world, it's not like the culture of previous ages. So we're definitely be going to talk with women, have some interaction with them. Although actually the Brahmachari Ashram is the best for that. I mean, I must say that before I took sannyas, and especially before I started initiating disciples, I really didn't have much to do with women at all. But especially after taking disciples, I mean... Also, women are their disciples, and you can't just ignore them or neglect them. Although, the traditional Vedic system is that the, the men will be instructed, and then they will instruct their wives. But then again, the modern age is different. So some feelings will be there, but uh, one should always be not unfriendly, but at the same time reserved, formal. Not joking and all these things. It requires your own internal determination. Then, and then it's possible by the by the blessings of Guru and Krishna. If one has internal determination, then they will help. Hmm. Krishna, I want to how to de determine one's faith in Krishna consciousness, or rather, what is the symptom of faith? Well, if you have faith, then you won't be thinking about how to measure it, will you? Isn't it? Like, is there an effect of faith or something? Like that? Is yeah, the effect of faith is that uh, one serves Krishna without any reservations. If you don't have faith, if you're doubtful, then you'll always have reservations about serving Krishna. If you have faith, then you won't have any hesitation. You'll just serve Krishna, that's all. If we don't have full faith, that means we we will be developing attachments elsewhere. If we don't have full faith in Krishna, then we'll be thinking, what do I have to do for my security in future? Who's going to look after me? And all this kind of thing. If we don't have full faith in Krishna, then we'll be thinking, what do I have to do for my security in future? Who's going to